The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory, Glory be to you, O Lord. Lord. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, what commandment in the law is greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. You may be seated. So this morning, for the sermon, I'm going to share, as I said in the announcements, a sermon that was preached yesterday at the closing worship of the ELCA Youth Gathering by our presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. So you're going to need to use your imaginations this morning. I want you to pretend that you're teenagers. <laughs> and I want you to pretend that in this room, you are actually sit seated at an arena that is shared by 16,000 other Lutheran teenagers, which is exactly what has happened in the last week. The theme for the 2024 youth gathering was created to be, and the theme verse, uh, our psalm for this morning, Psalm 139, talks about how we are created by God and created by God for God's purposes. So our youth traveled on Monday down to New Orleans. Uh, we had five of our youth and two adult leaders who uh, went down to the gathering to join 16,000 of their best new friends from all across the United States and they had a week of worship and prayer and music and singing and learning and serving uh, and uh, just an amazing, powerful experience. I wanted to give you a little taste of what that experience was like. There's our group uh, at, the, uh, at the convention center, one of the days that they were there. Uh, you can see Pastor Jake and LaVon Onheiser. You can see Nick and Megan and Nate and Jaden and Evelyn who were all there. And I was talking with them back and forth throughout the week. Um, other than the fact that it rained a lot, um, they had an absolutely delightful time. And I am excited for them to come and share their stories with all of you. So each night there was a different variance on the, the theme of created to be. Uh, the first night, they talked about created to be brave. Uh, the second night, they talked about being created to be authentic. The third night, they talked about created, that we are created to be free, free in Christ. And the fourth night, they talked about created to be disruptive, people who challenge the systems of this world and work for justice. It's kind of hard to see on the slide, but that is uh, the Smoothie King Arena. Uh, the stage is in the very center, and this is a picture uh, from the vantage point of our youth group, and that place was absolutely packed with 16,000 young people and adult leaders. Uh, a really powerful experience. Uh, and for the closing worship, our presiding bishop, Bis Bishop Elizabeth Eaton, shared these words, and so hear the words of our bishop. She says, and remember, you're teenagers, right? All right, keep that in your mind. Keep in mind that you've been there for a whole week, that maybe you're tired, you've not slept in your own bed, you've walked a lot, you've stood in a lot of lines, you've waited a lot. She says, grace to you and peace from our Creator, from Jesus, our friend and Savior, and from the mighty Holy Spirit, 
Amen. We made it! There was great applause at that point. What a week! We've been through so much. We've learned a lot. We've met new people. We've learned how it rains in New Orleans all the time. Just a wonderful thing. We've had our ups and our downs. I'm sure that you will spend time on your bus or plane or car, however it is that you're getting yourselves back home, talking about the real high points, how exciting it was, and maybe not even the mass gathering time, maybe there are some other times that were high points, maybe when it was just a few of you, or maybe just yourself when you were taking it all in. And we have had some low points. We had an incident where people who are fully children of God, baptized believers and fully Lutheran, were made to feel as if they did not belong. And then, being authentic, we issued a heartfelt apology. And that's something that we need to be mindful of. We might not mean what people hear, but it's not intent, it's impact. So for that learning moment, I give thanks to Deacon Tammy Jones West and for the rest of the crew for really helping us to understand that and to say that we are sorry. So just an aside about that specific paragraph. There was an incident at the gathering where apparently a group of people made some slurs, some very hurtful, inappropriate comments to another group of people who were there based on their differences and uh, in a very, uh, I think, appropriate and healing way, they addressed that very directly and very head on and the evening before had addressed that situation and Bishop Eaton is referring to that there um, and I appreciate her words and her leadership in showing that when we see that there is harmful words or conduct, that we confront it, we challenge it, and we recognize that sometimes even we ourselves need to repent. I'll continue with her words. So now, here we are. We've been brave, authentic, free, disruptive, and now we're going to be disciples. We come to Sunday worship, and we hear the gospel lesson, and it seems like a nice encounter between Jesus and the, this person, except it's not. You see, this person was a trained scholar in the Torah and was trying to trap Jesus. The gotcha question, by the way, was not invented in the 21st century. So here he is asking Jesus, which is the greatest commandment, knowing that in Torah there are over 600 commandments. Okay, Jesus, you figure it out. And then Jesus does figure it out. In this account, Jesus is the one who gives the answers. In other gospel accounts, Jesus says, to the person asking that question, and what do you say? Which is a very Jesus thing to do, to put a question back on us. And the trained Torah scholar listens as Jesus holds up these two commandments, which in some gospels say, upon these hang all the law and the commandments. And so, love God with everything that you have, every single bit, every fiber, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's another story in the Gospels where a person comes up to test Jesus, and this time he asks the question, who is my neighbor? Hoping that that answer would be, oh, only the people that I know, only the people next to me or across the street. 
And then Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, which in itself is stunning because no Jew would call a Samaritan good and no Samaritan would call a Jew good. And so he tells the story of this Jewish fellow going down to Jericho, which is actually quite a descent down from Jerusalem and he's beset by robbers. They beat the stuffing out of him, leave him for dead, and there he is in the ditch. And then, of course, the usual suspects come by. First, the priest, which would be people like me. Um, oh, no, sorry, got to go, bye. It could be that he was on the way to some official liturgical action and could not touch somebody who might be dead because then he would be ritually unclean. And then came two other people who just kept going by. We did an interesting experiment at Harvard Divinity School while I was there. We staged this where someone actually had fallen down and people, students, you know, good divinity students, were going by and it depended. If we were late to class, we would walk right by that person who was not feeling well. So Jesus tells all this and in comes the Samaritan, this unlikely person. And he binds up the wounds and puts the person on his donkey and takes him to the inn, makes sure that there's money to care for him the whole time. And then Jesus asks the question, not who is my neighbor, but who acted as neighbor to this man? And that's how Jesus turns this around. We're told that we must love our neighbors as ourselves. We don't get to pick and choose who those people are. Those people are whomever God sends to us in our lives. People, even people we've never met before. So we have this teaching, this Torah scholar thought he had tripped Jesus up. Because if you say one commandment is more important than the other, then you're not really being faithful to the entire law, etc., etc. But Jesus gives this commandment. We've been trying all this week long. We've been trying to be brave and authentic and free and disruptive. We've been trying to do good works, which... Lutherans do do good works. We just know that we don't have to worry about that in order to get into heaven because Jesus has taken care of that for us. So we're here. My guess is that some of you who are showing amazing amounts of energy this morning might be sleeping on the bus or on the plane on the way home. Good. And give your advisors a break. Let them sleep too, unless they're driving. So we've got all this stuff going on. We're trying to be good and we're trying to be brave and free and authentic and disruptive. We get all that going on and then we're going to go back to our own congregations, our own places, our own synods and there we are not going to be with 16,000 of our fellow travelers. You're going to be by yourself. Some of us only in groups of two or three. And so off we go. And we're really going to try to do everything that we learned this week. Keep it straight. Keep it straight. We can do this. Okay, all at the same time, let's be brave and authentic and free and disruptive. We have to make sure we do this. It's, it's just like it's too much to fit into one person or group. How 
Are we going to keep it up? It's like the spiritual equivalent of making a really complicated Starbucks order. You know, ice, triple vente, half cap, half cap brevi, one and a half pump, sugar-free, toffee nut, latte, and fit it all in a tall. And then, I have to say, I have been disturbed by Psalm 139. It's like it's been with us all week long. And some of the translations that are used, it's even more dire. It says, God, investigate my life. Get all the facts firsthand. I am an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I am thinking. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know, it's like that wonderful Christmas song that we sing to children. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So, be good, for goodness sake. Good night, kids. So as we're leaving this place, this wonderful experience that we have had, and thank you to the entire youth gathering staff, we've heard amazing stories and testimonies how people feel that in Christ they are whole and holy, beloved. And we're to take home and try to exercise this. Maybe we only have to be brave on Tuesday and then authentic on Wednesday and then free on Thursday and disruptive on Friday. But all at once, how on earth are we going to do all of that? And is this really about the work that we do? Is it dependent on that? When will it ever be enough? If we are concerned that we have to be brave and free uh, enough, authentic and disruptive, when will it be enough? When will we love our neighbors enough? When will we love God enough? When will it ever, ever, ever be enough? And that can get exhausting. But you know, Jesus had this encounter with this Torah scholar after he had ridden into Jerusalem in glory. After everyone had shouted their hosannas and just before Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, Jesus came in then. It's in this part here, and Jesus shows us, shows us how it is possible for us to live into God's story and the work that Jesus has already done in us and will continue to do. Well, we know that Jesus ends up beaten, stripped, humiliated, nailed to a cross. We know this. And we know that the Romans and the other authorities, maybe even the whole world, was saying, Brave? This is a helpless person. Are you kidding me? Wow. Authentic? He's a fraud. He could save other people. Have him come down now from the cross and save himself. He's a fraud. Wow. Free? Clearly, if you are nailed to a cross and you're under the subjection of the authority of the Roman Empire, you cannot be free. There is no way on earth. And disruptive. The intent of crucifixion was not only to kill someone, but to humiliate and erase them. How is this disruptive? But in fact, we know and trust, and maybe, maybe especially when we don't know and don't trust, that in fact the cross was the greatest gift 
that we have ever received, the most beautiful thing that God has done. Here is brave. Here is authentic. Here is free. Here is disruptive. And as we heard from Pastor Azar last night, it's the greatest disruption in all of history, in all of creation. The disruption that says death and deadly things and those people with power, the world, the way the world sees power, that they're the ones who win and get the last word. Jesus did not stay dead, but God raised him from the dead and said no. We hear that we must love our neighbor, and we hear that we should love our neighbor. But what happens in this wonderful, transforming, liberating, completely disruptive action of Jesus, which is far more brave than the soldiers holding him captive, far more brave and far more interest free, interestingly, than those who thought that they were the ones who had power. What we learned and what we know is that we will love our neighbor. That that will be part of who we are. And the commandments, all of them, especially the Ten Commandments, but now because of this freedom, this disruption that Jesus has done, we see the commandments not as you had better do this or you're not measuring up so you better do that, but instead because we are free in Christ, still imperfect, still broken, still sinners and saints at the same time, now these become promises. You will love God with everything you have, with everything you are. It's not like you better get on board, you better get busy, you better work harder. No, we will, and we will love our neighbors as ourselves. It will be a freely given gift because of the gift that Jesus gave to us on the cross. Now, dear friends, we're powerful when there are 16,000 of us. We're powerful and we're strong and we, we get people's attention. But when we go back to our congregations, our neighborhoods, our communities, it's a little more difficult. And people might look at us and say, really? Really? But think of all of the times that people said, really? Think of Goliath when he saw David, really? That's all you've got? That's it? Or the Canaanite kings when they saw Deborah, really? Really? Are you kidding me? Or an ossified church when it saw this Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, this guy? Really? Are you kidding me? Or the Montgomery bus system when they saw Rosa Parks. Really? Or Hurricane Maria when it saw the Caribbean Synod. Really? Or death when death saw Jesus humiliated, broken, naked on the cross. Really? When people see us, they might say, really? And we say, yes, really. Keeping our eyes on the cross, being aware that the ultimate answer has been given and that there's no power in heaven and on earth that can stop Jesus can stop the gospel, can stop us as messengers of the gospel. 
hold on to that. And also, be bold and brave when people say, you? And you say, really? Amen. So we are called, all of us, to be brave, authentic, free, and disruptive disciples of Jesus Christ. May it be so with us as well. Amen. And here's the theme verse for the week we heard in our psalm. We say to God, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Let us stand now as we sing our hymn for the day. <laughs>